Hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Sean Rohde. I'm with JDS Industries. Uh, this webinar, Troubleshooting and Color Matching for Sublimation, we'll be covering a lot of different things. Um, if you're just getting started sublimation, uh, I'd like to remind you that, you know, like any process, sublimation has its uh, challenges and uh, it's a beautiful process, but there's things to learn and there's a learning curve with it. Uh, we're going to be recording this video this webinar, so if at a later date uh, you want to review it, it will be archived on our website at some point, so you can uh, tune in for that, and I'll show you where that's located once it gets uh, archived. Uh, so what is this uh, troubleshoot? Besides troubleshooting and color matching, uh, in more detail, we're going to be covering things like banding, uh, why my reds are turning pink, uh, what does old ink look like, printer adjustments, printer settings, some uh, variables that include the transfer, the inks, the paper, the heat pressing, and then we're going to do some color matching as well. So we've actually have some actual examples to show you uh, because if you if you run into some issues and you're not sure what the issue is, it's difficult to resolve those issues, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Now this isn't going to cover everything uh, about sublimation, and I tell people that sublimation is a minute to learn, lifetime to master. So you're going to run into some, some challenges along the way, and hopefully they're not going to be too serious, but we're here to help. So I'm one of five sublimation specialists at JDS Industries. So if you ever have any issues, you can always give us a call, send us an email. Uh, so this is going to cover some of the basics, uh, some of the things you might run into along the way, and uh, again, this isn't going to cover everything, but future webinars probably will, so stay tuned for those. All right, can everybody, I'm going to see a show of hands. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm hearing yes. Okay, good. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is banding. And if you've ever had an inkjet printer, you've probably seen this before. This is a fairly common uh, occurrence with any inkjet printer, and sublimation is no different. Uh, what is banding, though? Banding occurs when the ink cannot push through a nozzle. And your printer, or any inkjet printer, has several hundred nozzles per channel. Per channel, I mean per color. So specifically, we're talking about four color printers, probably the Ricos and Sawgrass printers. If you have a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black printer, and any one of those nozzles, any one of those colors, has 200 nozzles, if it doesn't have ink moving through it, it's going to give you a line. Uh, this is an example of a transfer and the actual finished product where banding is occurring. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see what that looks like. So you can see there are some white lines going through this print. And because it's a photograph, it's kind of difficult to see what, uh, what particular channel is having trouble. So I can't exactly tell from this photograph if it's the yellow, the cyan, black, or the magenta, or some sort of combination of, of those. But you can see it also shows up in the actual sublimated product here. And, uh, couple things. Uh, why does this happen? Well, a few things. Uh, for instance, if, you're, if your ink is getting a little old, uh, that can be a cause for banding. Uh, if the printhead is wearing out, that can cause banding. Also, if the ink has been in the printer longer than six months, um, that can cause troubles. Uh, if the printer hasn't been printed on for a long time, that can cause problems as well. So, a few rules about sublimation. Now, I'm going to show you what I'm going to explain some of the rules about sublimation that we like to, uh, some guidelines that we like to adhere to, but this is a nozzle check. And if you're seeing a good nozzle check, what you're seeing is uh, a pattern, yellow, magenta, black, and cyan. These patterns are going to look identical except for color. Uh, bad nozzle check, and I'll zoom in on what that looks like. You're going to see missing lines, and each, each one of these lines represents a single nozzle. So if you're missing some nozzles in here, you're going to see the white lines. Uh, there are occasions when you will see a good nozzle check and you're still getting uh, some banding or some other issues, and I'll cover that too. Uh, but this is your first line of defense. And the way to access a nozzle check, and by the way, you can use just regular paper for these nozzle checks. You don't have to use sublimation paper. But uh, the way to access that is through your start button and through your control panel or your devices and printers. Uh, you can also do this through your printer preferences uh, when you go to print. But located in here, you're going to see uh, your drivers. Uh, in the power driver or in your uh, OEM driver, you're going to have a printing preferences. So you right-click on the power driver, go to printing preferences, and you're going to see some options in here. One of them is going to be utilities. Uh, this is a newer 
power driver. So this has a few more options. Right in here is where you're going to find the nozzle check, the head clean, file spooler, head maintenance, print primaries, full page color test, also ink status. And we're going to talk about more of those as well. But that's where you're going to find your nozzle check and all the other utilities. All right. So in the power driver utilities, and I'm going to show you a view of an older one. This is what this would look like. So you would uh, go through the same process to find this, but it looks a little different in an older version. Here's where the utilities are located, and there's your nozzle check, some head cleaning options. Uh, typically with a normal banding, a head cleaning is uh, the first option. So you do a head cleaning, maybe two. Uh, I don't usually, I tell people not to do multiple, multiple head cleanings uh, if you're getting the same result. At that point, um, you may want to give us a call and we can do some other troubleshooting with that. But if, you're, if you have a good nozzle check and you're still getting banding, one of the op other options here is the print primary. And what that's going to do is actually print a solid block of a single color on a page. And that's in the older power drivers. It'll print, print this block of magenta or cyan, uh, yellow or black. Now in the newer versions, you can actually print all four on one page. And so it makes it a little easier. And here I've got a graphic representation of what that would look like if you did have some banding in the cyan, let's, let's say. And so that's what you would see these lines going through your print. And so then you can identify which channel you're having trouble with. And then when you go to do your head cleaning, you can choose two of the four channels to clean. So you don't have to clean all four. You might actually be able to clean it by just doing a full page color test. Just by printing, you can actually sometimes resolve banding. Uh, so again, there are some things you can do to prevent um, banding, and there's also some resolutions if you do get banding. Okay, um, this is a this is kind of a tricky one because you may get uh, some lines in your prints, um, but when you go to do a nozzle check, it may actually look okay. Uh, and if you have a partially clogged nozzle, that's uh, there'd be enough ink to actually do a nozzle check, but you may get some what I call spitting. So if you have a partially clogged nozzle, uh, the ink does not lay down. Uh, perfectly vertically, and you can see some cyan that's spitting right around this logo and some text here. So that if you see that kind of random dots occurring, and it's going to happen with uh, straight magenta, straight cyan, yellow, or black. If you see those random dots in the, any of those four colors, or if you have um, more color channels, you'll see those colors. If it's happening right around the areas where it's supposed to be printing, then that's usually an indication you have a partially clogged nozzle. And again, it's just a, usually just a simple head cleaning can fix that, or printing uh, the print primaries. Okay, um, so how do we prevent that? Well, we prevent it by doing some printing. I tell people, try to keep these printing two or three times a week if possible. Um, leave your printer turned on so it can do its own maintenance. It actually uses less ink. Uh, we're talking about the Ricos and Sawgrass printers, uses less ink if you keep them turned on and they're allowed to do their own maintenance because it actually recycles a lot of that ink back into the print head. So that's one of the advantages of, of these new printers. If you were to turn the printer on and off and every, day, every day, it actually uses more ink because it has to go through that cycle every time you power the printer on. Uh, so yeah, you leave the printer on and it'll do its own maintenance. Uh, also, try to use the inks within the use by date, which is on the broad side of the card. It'll give you a use by date. Uh, try to use the inks within six months. Uh, you can fudge on that a little bit with some of the colors. Yellow is one you can't fudge with, and I'll talk about what that looks like if you do in just a moment. You can also have uh, these new drivers also have something called a maintenance scheduler. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, again, I'm going to go back to the devices and printers. And again, right-click on your power driver, click on printing preferences, and in the utilities, this head maintenance scheduler. Uh, if you get this message, click yes. Also, if you get another message here, click OK. Here's where, if you're going to be gone for a couple weeks, you can actually schedule your printer to do nozzle checks and head cleanings uh, with whatever frequency you want. So if you click on nozzle check or head cleaning, uh, one or more, uh, you can choose what day you want to have a nozzle check done. Uh, just make sure you have paper in your printer and also that your computer is turned on. And you can set the start date and end date. Now, if you don't have one of these newer power driver uh, options, if you have an older power driver, you can also uh, look into something called Harvey Head Cleaner. It basically does the same thing. So that's a nice option if you're going to be away from your printer for a while. 
All right. Two dates to remember. So as we talked about, uh, use by date, uh, which is on the side of the cartridge. There's also another date to remember, and that's the day you install it in the printer. Uh, this can be, um, on the new carts, you'll see that they actually, this here's some of the older carts right here, and the newer design actually, and this is a pretty poor photograph, but they actually put the dates on the edge of the cart now too. But you can see right down here, I've actually written the date that I install the cart. Uh, and that's important because these inks do degrade a little bit faster at, once the seal has been punctured. Uh, if you've purchased a printer within the last, oh, say two weeks or so, you've probably gotten a sticker like this for your printer. And this is a uh, dry erase sticker that you can put on the outside of your printer. You can also put the day you install the inks right over here next to the color channel. It also has a list of all the different part numbers in case you need to reorder here and a handy phone number for tech support. Okay, uh, let's check. This is a common one too. Uh, when people say my reds are turning pink, well, what's usually going on here? Uh, first thing is to check your color management. So if your color management looks okay, because that's the cheapest option, color management looks okay, generally what we're looking at is probably a yellow that's gotten a little old. So typically with a new yellow, a new magenta, uh, and when, by the way, when you make red, those are the two primary colors that make red. Uh, there may be uh, some cyan, some black, depending on what kind of red you're making, but most of the time it's going to be magenta and yellow. Now if both of these are new, this is what your red is going to look like right here. But, and this is just a graphic representation, but if your yellow is getting old, it's going to look a little pale, kind of like this one here. And when you mix the yellow and the magenta get together, the old yellow, you're going to get something that looks less than red, something that looks a little pink. Again, I go back to the six-month rule on the yellow. Uh, it will start to shift with, on, on you after that six-month period. So um, that's something to look for. All right. Old ink. This is an extreme example of what happens with old ink. Uh, so this is an example of uh, a customer of ours who had ink that was left in the printer for over two years. Up here on top, this is on this left side here, this is the old ink uh, photograph of the old ink. This is the transfer, and you can see the ink's actually transferred off quite well, but the vibrancy just isn't there. Uh, this is a photograph of a transfer and a uh, piece of metal that was sublimated. And you can see the difference of how vibrant these are compared to these, uh, especially this blue and the, the royal blue here, and these are the, just the basic RGB palette. This blue is just uh, completely faded out, where this one is a nice royal blue. Uh, so that's that's what happens when your colors do shift over time. Uh, so you want to try to use up your inks within six months. If you can, uh, try not to leave your inks on the shelf. I tell people not to stock up on inks, just to use us as their inventory and buy as needed. All right. Here's another way to, uh, to see if you have a particular channel. If you're not sure when you bought your ink and you're wondering, well, why are my colors off? Uh, if you print some shades of gray, so I, I've got this, this band here from black to about 20% black. This is the, the basic RGB palette uh, colors in gray. Uh, the nice thing about gray is it tells you, it's kind of like the canary in the coal mine. When you print grays, it's using all four color channels equally to, to produce gray. If they're not equal or if, they're, if there's an ink that's not performing like it should, it's going to get a tint. Uh, if you have an old yellow, your grays are going to look, and this is sort of extreme, but your gray ears are going to look a little pinkish, sort of a lavender color. Uh, if your cyan is weak, then it's going to be a little bit of a tannish. If your magenta is weak, it's going to be a little kind of a greenish color. Now, if you have more than one ink that is having trouble, uh, kind of all bets are off. This is probably not the best test. But if it's just one channel and you see these one of these three tints, uh, that's an indication that one of these is getting a little long in the printer. Okay, this is often, this is a paper feed issue, oftentimes mistaken for banding. Um, this is an image over here, don't worry about this, I actually blurred this, this is a phone number, I didn't want you to see the phone number there, but I'm gonna show you what the banding looks like. You're gonna see lines through the prints, but this is not a head clog issue. You can see these darker lines in here, this is actually a solid purple, but it has these darker lines, and what's happening is the paper 
is not matching the print. So the print that's coming out needs to be needs to come out a little bit further. So it needs a paper adjustment. It's actually the ink printing right on top of itself. And when it does that, it makes a darker line. Um, you can see this um, person actually took the photo with his cell phone here. You can see the reflection. But in here, you see the darker lines. And that is, again, an indication that there's a paper feed issue. You cannot fix that by doing head cleanings. So how do we resolve that one? Well, again, you would go into your utility, um, but this one you would actually go into the uh, the Rico or the Sawgrass utility. So I'm going to show you where that is. Again, go into your devices and printers, and you're going to look for not the power driver, but say uh, one of these Rico drivers here. So if I go into printing preferences or one of the Sawgrass printing preferences, you're going to see the maintenance tab up here. And this is where all these options are. You also have some head cleaning options, head flushing options. By the way, head flushing, don't recommend until you are exhausting all other avenues. Call us first before you do head flushing. It uses out more ink than uh, than what you may need to use. Paper feed adjustment, or the adjust paper feed is right here. All right, so and there's a lot of other utilities in here, but that's where that's located. And I'm going to show you how that works. After you click on the adjust paper feed, then you're going to see a window that pops up that looks like this, um, and you're going to click next, and it's going to say, do you want to print this pattern? And again, you can use regular paper for this. And in, once it prints that pattern, then you're going to see a page that prints out on your printer, something like this. I'm going to zoom in to show you what this looks like. What we're looking for on here is the straightest line in that pattern, and that straightest line should be on zero. You can see that this line is kind of jagged. So this one does need some adjustment. Where the best line is, if you can find out where the best line is, it's actually on this negative 14. So what do we do? Okay, your next option in here is to tell the paper feed adjustment that you need to adjust the value to negative 14, because that's where the best line is. And then you click this little X to print another pattern. And once you do that, then you take a look at that pattern and see if it was adjusted correctly. I'm gonna zoom in here to see what this looks like and there's your straight line next to the zero. That's what we want. Okay, so pretty simple. Usually within one or two of these adjustments, you're back in business. Print head out of alignment. Uh, so what what is this? Okay, so if your print is out of alignment, you're gonna see your prints not looking the way they should because there's gonna be uh, some areas that are a little askew. Uh, your print may also look a little fuzzy. This often happens if there's a paper jam uh, where the, the paper may have actually moved the print head slightly. Uh, also, if the printer's been jostled around or moved to a different location, sometimes the print head can get out of alignment. I'm going to zoom in real close here to show you what that looks like. And you can see that this on this M, there's kind of a bump out. Right here's a little bump in. The O's got the same issue going on right there. I'm going to drag over to this N. You can see this N isn't straight here. It's pushed out, and it seems like there's there's a couple heads just moving to the left or right where they're not supposed to be. So that's a print head out of alignment. How do we get back to alignment? Uh, similar situation. We're going to go back into that maintenance into the uh, Rico driver or the Sawgrass driver, and there you're going to have those options in here to print another test pattern. So here's the adjust print head position, and once you do that, you're going to be asked, do you want to... Uh, do you want to do this? You click next. Uh, you're going to do this again. You can use regular paper for this. This doesn't have to be sublimation paper. And after that, you're going to see a little pattern print out, similar to the one you saw earlier, but a little different. But again, we're looking for straight lines, but this time they're going to be vertical lines that we're looking for. And they're all going to be, or should be, under the zero. And I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see what that looks like. Okay, here you can see straight lines next to the B row underneath the zero, so those are straight. C is straight, however the A, not so straight. All right, where is it straight? It's probably either this positive two, positive three. So once you've identified where the straight line is, you're gonna go back into your print head uh, position adjustment, and on row A, you're gonna do, you're gonna click on the little up arrow to three, click finish, and then you're going to print out another pattern to see how you did. And there you will see 
the straightest lines are going to be underneath the zero, the vertical lines. So pretty simple. Within Again, within one or two uh, uh, adjustments, you should be able to get that back to where it needs to be. You can also do this adjustment actually right from the printer as well. Okay, envelope selector. Now this is uh, an option that was on the some previous Ricos, the 3300, the 7700, and the 7000. Uh, it's not on the newer versions because they don't uh, they don't have this. But with these printers, it actually had an option to to print envelopes. But with sublimation, we're not sublimating envelopes. But this lever did exist. So occasionally, this lever would get moved up into the envelope selection. And what that did is it moved the print head up slightly to accommodate for a thicker envelope. And if you if that envelope selector was up and you were just printing paper, it actually would be just slightly out of focus. And this is what this was an example of a print head that's slightly out of focus. It's not individual dots. Um, it's not some it doesn't it's not ghosting exactly, but it's just kind of a fuzzy haze around these letters. Uh, that is an example of a print head out of out of um, out of focus. So that's a finished example. Here's the transfer. I'll zoom in on this one here. You can see kind of, a, again, there's that haze going around the letters. And a simple solution, you just move the letter back down to paper, and then you're back in business. Um, new printers, uh, the new newer Ricos, the 3110 and the 7100, and the Sawgrass printers do not have this envelope option, so it's that's not going to be an issue with those. Oversaturated transfer. All right, so this was sent in to me. Um, customer didn't know what was going on exactly, and I found out later that he was using a larger format printer with a RIP software. And one of the things that can happen with more controls, uh, a RIP software has a little more control uh, than some of the other options you might have. Sometimes too much control can get you into too much trouble. So here's an example of his artwork. He sublimated, sublimated a badge, but you can see there's a lot of ink left over in here. It's kind of this bumpy ink. Uh, and down here, it's a very dark image right below it. Now, the actual artwork, you can see it over here. It's kind of a nice bright red. This is almost heading into the maroon area. So it was just printing way too saturated. And here's uh, another example of, and this actually really tells the story. Here's a black line next to yellow. And the black was printing so saturated that it's bleeding into the yellow. Now, you're probably not going to see this extreme saturation if you're using the power drivers, if you have a Rico or Sawgrass printer. But you can get into trouble if you have too much saturation. By the way, here is, here's an example of what uh, that artwork looked like on the Rico printer. And this one will happen to be a 7100. And you can see the ink is transferred off evenly. About 90% of the ink is transferred off evenly. There are no blobs and the color looks fairly accurate uh, compared to the artwork. Uh, so that brings us to the next thing, color settings. Color settings in the power driver and the newer versions of the power driver. Um, you had a few options with the older one. Uh, so you had, and this is where you would go into the preferences, the output, you had realistic, saturated, intense, or grayscale. If you had a photograph, you would typically leave it on realistic. If you were doing graphics, uh, you might want to put it on saturated. It pushes out a little bit more ink. Uh, the intense setting pushes out even more ink, but I think that uh, sometimes this is a little bit too saturated even for uh, some graphics. And then there's a grayscale option, which you could have used if you wanted to take your color image and make it just permanently grayscale through the output. Not on the actual file, but on the output. On the newer versions, on the newer printers, uh, you have a few more options, a few different options. The realistic has been replaced with a photo, so uh, similar look. It's uh, If you have a photograph, you can use the photo setting. Graphics, you use graphics. Uh, they changed, the only thing that changed here was the, how they spelled the grayscale. They added an E instead of an A. Uh, just an observation there, not sure why. But anyway, then over here you have a lot of these color adjustments that I typically do not use. Um, and I generally don't recommend using them unless you're really uh, fairly advanced. If you're just getting started, I would go ahead and not mess with this here. Uh, I usually typically do all my color adjustments in my software. Um, 
and that's where you know I can make things more saturated or less saturated. Uh, if you want to play around with this and you get good at it, uh, this is actually a great tool to use. But if you're just getting started, this might be a little more advanced and uh, might just actually be more confusing than uh, what you need. Okay, so let's get into a few more examples of some things that could go wrong as you're as you're going through sublimation. Now, this is an example of the wrong transfer being used or wrong transfer paper being used. Uh, we carry two different brands. We carry a text print brand and we carry a true PIX brand. The text print has two different options. You can use the text print for Epson printers and you can use the text print for Ricoh printers. And the the paper absorbs differently depending on which paper you use. So for Epson's, um, it's the XP. For Ricoh's, it's the R option. If you're using TruePix, you can actually use that paper for both printers. But this is an example of where a customer is using the text print XP paper in his RICO. And so when I saw this, I immediately knew what this was. So he was showing me little dots in his sublimation. You can see four little dots here, then it becomes three little dots, and then there's two little dots over here. The dots are equally spaced, and the set of dots are equally spaced. So this is definitely something mechanical. There's definitely ink getting on whatever it is that is mechanical. It's probably a rotating wheel that's helping to push out the paper. And from that, I could determine that the ink was printing out too wet. And one of the only things that can happen, uh, it could have been an oversaturation, but typically it's uh, the wrong paper. So if you, you're using XP and you have a Rico, it's not drying fast enough. So some of the printer parts are actually collecting the ink and then transferring it onto the next transfer. And then, of course, it gets sublimated. Uh, another example of this is down here, probably a little more extreme example. And you can see, again, those dots moving through a transfer right there. And it can happen with really any color. Here he was printing it. Um, there were some red in the print, and you can see the red dots moving through the transfer there. All right. Um, moisture in the paper. So if you are not in a controlled environment, if you uh, have a lot of humidity in, in the location where you're doing printing, you're, you may see this. This is an example of moisture in the paper. And what happens with moisture in the paper when you put it in a heat press? Well, it turns to steam. And when it turns to steam, it's doing that at about the same time your ink is turning into a gas. And when, steam, when it turns into steam, it wants to escape. And so you, see, you might see these jets popping out. That's where it's taking the ink with it as it's moving out of the heat press. And and you can tell that it's it's actually moisture. I'm going to zoom in a little closer. You can see it's slightly concave, convex or concave on this side, opposite on the, this side. And so you can see the direction it's traveling. The steam's going this way. And I know that it's not ink moving this direction because of this dent right here. This There's not much ink right here. So I know that this is not ink moving through. This is moisture. Um, because there is a the the steam is moving right here and it's pushing its way right out. So if you see the, see these little jets, that's an indication of moisture in the paper. How do we prevent this? Well, um, you want to keep your paper in a Ziploc bag if you're not in a controlled environment. Uh, so your paper does whatever your environment does. Uh, beyond that, if you if you forgot to Ziploc your bag and you're you're in a hurry and you need to get uh, if you see moisture in your paper and you need to get this. Uh, uh, project knocked out, you can lay the paper underneath the heat press for um, a few seconds, maybe up to a minute, not actually locking it, the press down onto the paper, but actually just letting it hover uh, to dry it out. So that's an option uh, to do before you actually print the transfer to relieve it of some of that moisture. Image printed on the wrong side of the transfer paper. This is actually a toughie. Um, it's hard to diagnose this one because it looks like so many other things. Here's the trans finished transfer up here. You can see there's a lot of ink left on the transfer. And then we've got all these little wavy lines going through the print uh, or through the product. And at first glance, this looks maybe like it didn't have enough dwell time or there might have been wrinkles in the transfer. Uh, maybe, it, uh, yeah, maybe it wasn't making the best contact. It's, it's difficult to say because it mimics other things. And that's why this one's hard to diagnose. But an easy one to fix once you figure it out. So 
With most transfer paper, you have a bright white side and you have an eggshell side. The bright white side is the side that you're going to be printing on. Some paper it's a little easier because there's actually a logo printed on the back of the paper. And with the Ricos and the Sawgrass printers and with I believe the, also the desktop Epsons, you're going to be putting that paper in face down. So the printed side is going to be face down on the tray. So maybe not the easiest to diagnose sometimes, but an easy one to fix. Okay, here's an example of a color sure button turned on when using gradients. So this artwork up here, a nice artwork, it's, going, it's got a gradient that's going from white to black or a darker color here. So there's a lot of color changing going through here. And in the power driver, you have an option to turn the color sure button on. The only time you should ever turn this button on is if you're using the color sure colors. I typically use just the RGB palette um, because uh, it likes to be in RGB mode. Uh, it's a pretty large palette. It's got, uh, you know, just in the workspace alone, it's got 100 colors, but there's literally thousands of colors to choose from. The color sure palette's a little bit smaller and it doesn't have as big a gamut. So if you're using an RGB palette to make your gradients and you have the color sure button turned on, it doesn't know what to do with some of those colors. And that's where you see these kind of lines just dropping in here. It's because the there just is not an option for some of these colors. Uh, so if you see that in a gradient, you'll see it specifically in gradients. That's where you will see this. You're not going to see this in, in a solid homogeneous color, like a big background of green or black or blue or red. You're going to see it in a gradient. But uh, easy to diagnose once you know what it is and easy to fix. You just turn that color sure button off. All right. Uh, we're going to kind of jump over here a little bit. Once you've once you've understood uh, all the different variables uh, about sublimation and uh, your, you've checked color management, uh, you've checked your inks and they're okay, your heat press is working, your printer is not banding, uh, everything, everything seems to be working fine, the operator seems to be, know what they're doing, uh, then it's just a matter of choosing color. So if you're having trouble finding a specific color, and usually uh, we get these requests uh, when there is a specific uh, a need, um, I'm going to move over to color matching. So let's say you have, and by the way, if you're using Illustrator or Photoshop, uh, the technique that we're going to show you in this is, doesn't exist in Illustrator or Photoshop, but it is still relevant because the files that we create can still be used in those programs. Uh, and just a quick uh, lesson, if you're using, if you're doing sublimation or any professional process. You want to have prof professional software. So I use CorelDRAW primarily, uh, Photoshop quite a bit, PhotoPaint, um, uh, Illustrator occasionally, but I tell people to try to use professional software. And it doesn't really matter if you are using CorelDRAW, Illustrator, or Photoshop, but as long as you're using one of those three, that's going to give you the best color. It's going to give you the most options uh, and use the program that you're most comfortable with. Uh, there isn't a program that's really better than another. Um, outside of this little example that I'm going to show you, that there, there are a lot of similarities with these programs. So use the one you're most comfortable with. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using CorelDRAW, but the files that we create can be used in any program. So we're going to be talking about the blend tool, and we're going to be talking about the creating palettes and using macros and the eyedropper. All right, so what are color palettes? Well, here's an example of some color palettes that have that I've created. Uh, here's an example of the default RGB uh, palette, and here's some other random palettes that I use with the RGB palette. Now, one of the things about sublimation that can be challenging um, is that every substrate's a little different, and the ink, which is really not an ink, it's a dye, is semi-translucent. So if you're printing colors on a piece of white aluminum and then you go to print on a white t-shirt or a yellow t-shirt, your results are going to be different because what you're doing is blending the color, the dye that you add with the substrate and the blending of those two colors is what you see. So that is the challenge. It's also one of the advantages to sublimation because you're actually putting the ink into the product and you can't take it out. But that presents another challenge. You have to color match based on the substrate you're using. 
So typically what I do when I get a new printer is I'll actually print the default palette and I'll print that on a, maybe I'll start with white aluminum and see what that looks like. So it gives me a base understanding of what those colors look like. I'm gonna zoom in on, on this color palette here. This actually shows me the RGB values and it shows me what those colors are. Um, and the RGB palette actually has names for all their colors that are in the workspace. Uh, if you start creating palettes, it's still going to give you those RGB values. All right, so let's see how those are actually created. Uh, so also, here's a here's a photograph of one of the palettes I created, and I actually put the I put the model of the printer, uh, the model of the power driver, or the version of the power driver. I put on the photo settings as the settings that were used, the paper I used, and the material. So that gives me uh, a base understanding of what what I'm using here um, and how it was how it was used. If you have a customer that sends you Pantone colors, that's okay because those can be converted to RGB. I typically do not use the Pantone colors, however, when I go to print. It's a nice reference tool because it, then you know what the color should look like or what you're trying to achieve. So if your customer has a logo and it's a a red that's 186 or 200, that's a pretty typical red. You can use that as a reference, but you're gonna use your RGB palettes that you create to match to that Pantone color. All right, so in CorelDRAW, a few steps to doing this. Uh, here I've put down just a little block of color, uh, red, and I'm gonna use uh, deep purple. Between these two colors, this is where I find a lot of the good reds that I use quite frequently. So in your Corel Draw, you've got an option. Usually it's uh, in your toolbar, somewhere located down below your text uh, text option here. It's in here. It's in this little flyout where the drop shadow is. Here's your blend tool. Okay, and this is what it looks like, uh, just blown up. This is your blend tool right here. So with your blend tool option selected, you're going to click on one color and migrate it to the next. So you just click and drag and drop. By default, uh, I've got mine set up to be 20 steps, but if I'm gonna make a color palette, and if my default page is eight and a half by 11, then I'm gonna actually change this to 60, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Okay, so now it's migrating from red to deep purple in 60 different steps. The next step is to break them apart, which is control K, and then ungroup. Okay, so now each, it's got 60 different color options that you can pull out. Now once you've ungrouped all these, you've broken them apart, you're gonna select them, and you're gonna go up to Window, Color Palettes, Create Palette from Selection. And I've got this set up, um, Usually it defaults into a folder called My Palettes, which is located, uh, it might be under your username, under Documents, My Palettes, okay? So we're gonna name this Red to Deep Purple. Purple. And you can see I've got quite a few in here. Click Save. And now we're gonna use uh, what's called a macro. And a macro is really just a set of instructions. And one of the macros that uh, CorelDRAW has is the create color swatch option. So in tools, you're gonna to go to macros and run macro. Now in earlier versions, I believe X4 and previous, uh, you would go to macros and click play. But from there, it was the same steps. So we're gonna run macro. You're gonna see a little window pop up here. And the macro options we're gonna be in are the global macros. And this one up here is called Create Color Swatch. That's the one we want. Click Run. And sometimes it'll give you uh, the option right away in this window right up here. But if not, you may have to go find it. So here's some things that I've done previously. Uh, if you have to go find it, you just go to Open. If it doesn't populate here, you go to Open. And you're going to go into your libraries, your documents, my palettes. Now the screen is empty, but if it is empty, go down to this little window here, and click all files. Okay, so here's all the files that we've created. 
uh, the one we are doing is called red to deep purple. So we select it, click open, and I'm going to change the spacing down here to five. We're going to push these a little closer together so we can get more on a page. Click OK. Now what CorelDRAW does is it creates uh, an actual file that you can use to print and sublimate, and the red to deep purple option uh, has been expanded through that through that gamut. Here's generally where I find the best reds, right in here. So this is a lot of times where I go to pick my reds. So, and it also has the RGB values right here. So once you've done that, once you've created your palette, you want to save that palette and put it somewhere where you can find it again. Uh, but the cool thing is once you create this palette, then it's easy to, to change colors on your artwork. So here I've got a logo off to the right here. And let's say I want to use some of these colors. I've actually sublimated this palette, and I say I, I really like you know, this particular color right here. In CorelDRAW, you just grab your eyedropper tool, select or click on the color that you're looking for, and then you can go ahead and start changing the color of your graphics uh, fairly easily. Uh, in the older versions, you would actually have to click the eyedropper and then go back and click the paint bucket. Uh, but since X5, it actually automatically turns into a paint bucket. So that is the way you would change colors fairly easily uh, with your graphics. So again, once you have all of your options, all the variables taken care of, the heat press is working, the ink is working, uh, and it's new, and your printer is working, and all your color management looks okay. Uh, and again, if you're unsure about any of those things, always give us a call because we can take a look at those for you. Once those are all okay, then it's just a matter of, of picking color. And what you see on your screen is not always what you're going to see as a result in sublimation because your monitors are making color with light and it has a much bigger option with, um, with color. So let's say, for instance, you see this little house here. It's like a lime green. I cannot print that. I cannot. I cannot sublimate that color the way it looks on my screen because it's it's almost a neon green. Almost a. Um, it's, it's almost looks like it's almost backlit. It's so bright. Uh, there are some colors that you you see on your screen that you cannot sublimate, uh, and vice versa. You know there are some let's say Pantone colors. Uh, I can get a lot of colors in in sublimation that I can't find in the Pantone, and vice versa. So the only true way to know what these colors are going to look like is if you actually sublimate it onto a particular product. And you may not have to sublimate them on every single thing that you do, but you want to get a, a range of products uh, sublimated. So you have a, at least a baseline understanding of what the colors look like. Uh, I usually tell people to start with that basic RGB palette and work from there. Uh, so that is how we do that. Now, if you're using Illustrator and Photoshop, we've actually got these files saved as EPS files too. So you can open them and use them in Illustrator and Photoshop. However, at this point, point. I don't believe Illustrator and Photoshop have this ability to create color palettes, but you can certainly use them. And that kind of brings me to my next uh, couple things I want to talk about. This, this example of using the blend tool to create color palettes is, uh, is its own YouTube video. And we have a YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash user slash JDS Industries. So you can go there and actually find this uh, this exact thing that we just did with Corel Draw. Um, also, if you're looking for resources about where to find uh, more of these color palettes, um, here's an example of what, after you log in, where these are located. So once you log in, you're going to see a resource option and a Dropbox for some of these resources. Uh, let's go ahead and see this. what this looks like live. Um, so here's the resources tab. If you click on that, this is what opens up here. This is the Dropbox Download Center. You click into here, and you're going to see sublimation information as well as a lot of different other things you can find. But in the sublimation information, we click in there, and you're going to see the RGB custom color palettes. There's also some tutorials, user guides, uh, some other useful information. Click into here, and you're going to see uh, all the ones we've created thus far. Now you're going to see a lot of these are Corel Draw files, but again, if you need an EPS file and you can't find what you're looking for, if you need to download one, uh, let us know what you're looking for and we can send those to you, um, either by email or, uh, well, email. 
primarily. All right, we've got a few minutes here. Uh, I'd like to take some questions. I know we've covered a lot of things in here, but I'd like to take a few questions. If you if you have something, I'd like you to shoot it at me. Um, this might go just a little bit over an hour. I want to go back to my Corel draw for a moment. First of all, if you're not a uh, JDS customer, uh, so if you're and here's a question: If you, how do we get how do we access this? Well, if you're not currently a JDS customer uh, and you want to be, just give our customer service a call. It's 800-843-8853. And once you uh, talk to the customer service agent, uh, you give them your sales tax ID, and a, they'll ask you a few questions. It's about a five-minute uh, step process. It's really easy to become a JDS customer. And once you do that, you have access to all the resources that we have available. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Ink collectors. Uh, yeah, ink collectors, that's a good one. So occasionally we, your ink collector, what's, what's nice about the Ricoh printers and the Sawgrass printers is they have an ink collector. Now some inkjet printers do not, they have this, but it's not replaceable. So on some inkjet printers, if it fills up, your printer might give you a message that says, components on your printer have reached their life expectancy, time to change the printer. Uh, with these Ricos and the Sawgrass, you know, if you're printing on them pretty regularly, you may get anywhere from three to five years, uh, hopefully. Uh, so the more you print on them, uh, the, actually the longer they last. But eventually you may find that your ink collector will fill up. And if it does, there's, there is an emergency reset for that. Uh, and there's also an ink collector that we sell for these particular printers, and they can range anywhere from, I believe, $29 to $35. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's where they're at. And there's one for there's one for each particular uh, printer. And once you uh, put the new ink collector in, it basically resets itself. Okay, which paper is better for ceramic versus T-shirts versus aluminum? Uh, good question. So here's our general rule about paper. Uh, the brands that we carry, the True Picks and the Text Print, they're both general purpose papers and you can use them for anything. However, I have found that I do like the Text Print a little bit better for soft substrates like apparel. Uh, it does release a little bit more ink. It, that paper actually has a releasing agent in it. Uh, the True Picks, I like that paper when I do hard substrates because it lays down the ink a little bit more evenly, especially with the aluminum. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, aluminum heats up very quickly, so the sublimation happens very quickly. And uh, with the true picks, we've seen that when it, when it sublimates, it transfers off really nicely, really smoothly. Uh, you don't see any, um, you don't only see any dark spots and light spots. It's a nice, especially if you'll see this when you have like a big background of red, uh, green or you know a solid color, you'll see that the True Picks lays down the ink really smoothly on on aluminum. Okay, what other questions do we have here? Having trouble getting a rich black on my sublimation acrylic. Uh, is there a trick to it? The sublimation acrylics uh, do require more dwell time. Um, one of the things I may have brushed over, but I think we have a little time to go back here. Um, I'm going to move back just a little bit. I jumped over something we should talk about. More dwell time. Um, so here's an example of some products that require a lot of dwell time. These are plaques. These are subless stones. Uh, these can take anywhere from Two and a, or a minute and a half to two minutes, depending on the size. Subless stones, anywhere from three to six minutes, depending. Uh, one thing we found is that the longer the dwell time, the harder it is to create a setting. Uh, for instance, this subless stone in one press takes about uh, five minutes in my 16 by 20 uh, George Knight, but uh, it might take um, it might take longer in a smaller press. So if you have a hobby press, 
it may take longer to actually transfer this off. I'm going to show you what these look like. These actually, when you sublimate products like this that do take a long time, you might see it and notice that they actually sublimate from the edges inward. So this center area it did not get complete, and you can see this by a lot of ink on the transfer up here. So if you've got a lot of ink left on the transfer, and you've got light spots on the product, that means you need more dwell time. So if you're having trouble like this, always keep your transfer, and, and then you can send me a picture, and I can give you at least a guideline on how much further you should go with the dwell time. Uh, same thing down here with the sub subless stones. Here is uh, a lot of ink left here, not much going on here. So it would need at least another minute in the heat press. Um, let me show you what too much dwell time looks like. And here again, it's a, it's a subless stone. And look what's going on here. We got paper sticking to the product. Every product has poly, uh, poly coating on it. And once that poly coating gets uh, really soft, the paper actually starts to embed itself into that poly coating. You can also see that some of the darker areas in here are starting to brown out a little bit. And look at this transfer paper, completely torched, completely browned out, it's crispy. Uh, so that's when you know you've got way too much dwell time. All right. I'm going to bounce up to one more here, because this is another common one. I think we have time to cover this one. Too much pressure. This is one I get a lot too. So I'll, a lot of aluminum that you can sublimate has a softer poly coating, and if you use too much pressure, you can get what looks like almost water spots. Now, this is a nice product to use because it's very easy to cut. Uh, that soft poly coating makes it easy to cut, but it needs a little more specific setting. So when we do Dynasub or Vivisub or Ultrasub, we lower the temp to about 390, so a little bit lower temp uh, than normal, 40 seconds is all you need in the press because it heats up very quickly and very light pressure. And when I say very light pressure, I mean it's so light that a four-year-old child can pull the handle down with one hand, almost just the weight of the press itself. And in order to get a nice even pressure when I've got that really light pressure, in order to get it nice and even, I use a soft paper towel underneath. So I layer it as such. I'll have a Teflon sheet, soft paper towel, then the transfer, then the metal, and then another um, another non-stick sheet and very light pressure. So the product that you put in the press, if it's glossy, should look glossy when it comes out. If it's got this kind of scratchy finish, there's nothing you can do to fix that. It's, it's there to stay, but there is a preventative. So just use a lot less pressure, a little lower temp, and a lower dwell time. All right. Take a look at some of these more some of these other questions here. Now some of these, if I don't get to all these questions, um, what I want you, well, I'll look at all these questions and actually answer you individually once I get back to uh, back to my desk. Okay, here's a good question. Uh, swing away versus clamshell. So a swing away press is generally what we recommend for sublimation, and the reason for that is the way the pressure comes down. On a swing away press, you, the pressure comes straight down on top of the product. With a clamshell, what you had is something that looked like an alligator's mouth, and the pressure comes down from back to front, and then releases from front to back. So the pressure is getting released unevenly, and Obviously, we have a lot of products that are thicker, such as the acrylics, and so the difficulty with the clamshell is it'll come down, hit the back of the edge of the acrylic, and has a hard time flattening out. Uh, the swing-away presses, because they generally have a nice gap of a, sometimes up to two inches, you can raise that up and put a nice thick substrate on there, and the pressure's nice and even front to back, side to side. Good question. Yeah, usually I say the, the swing away presses are, are what I recommend. A 16 by 20 size will cover just about everything in our catalog. Um, the digitals are nice. I like the digital options. Um, if, you, if you don't have a digital, if you have a manual, basically you're, you have an egg timer, uh, but then you have to make sure you turn that egg timer on every time you leave the press. Uh, so the programmable ones can also give you 
separate settings for if you're doing metal, you can set a setting for that. You can set a setting for sublistones. You can set a setting for other products, and you can kind of move on the fly, and it beeps when it's done automatically. Uh, track marks on my Ricoh printer when coloring or when printing color. Uh, yeah, I that we did cover that a little earlier. Um, that is probably uh, more than likely it's the wrong paper. If you're using a uh, text print XP through your Rico, again, it's going to it's going to print a little wet and leave ink on the rollers. So if you see these little roller dots, that's what that is. Any tricks to sublimating substrates larger than the press? Uh, that is that is difficult. Uh, whenever you have uh, to hit something twice, sublimate something twice. Uh, it's almost impossible to not see where you started and stopped. So there's always going to be a line, uh, especially if you're putting transfers together and you're kind of moving the product across the press, hitting it and moving it. Uh, it's very difficult to do. I would, I would say save yourself some headache and find someone that does wholesale work with a large press. Is there a form with all the heat press settings and temps? Uh, there used to be. And what we found is that because it changed so often, people clung on to these forms uh, like they're the Bible. And, and unfortunately, products do change over time, and uh, then it can cause problems. So the best place to go is to uh, the resources online. Again, it's, it's on this resources tool. And I'm going to show you uh, where to find some of these. So let's say I type in uh, a beverage insulator. Once I type that in, you're going to see the product right here. Uh, if you click on the how to, it should populate with all the instructions needed right here. So it gives you the time, temperature, and the pressure, but also how to layer the press and some things to avoid, uh, how to layer the press, and things to watch out for, some tips. So that's the best place to go because whenever we, uh, whenever we find a better way to do something, they get updated on the fly in real time. So if you have a printed flyer and things are changing, uh, you're not going to have the most up-to-date instructions. All right. Um, some of these other questions look a little involved, so I may, I may answer these offline. Uh, I'm going to switch back to our tutorial here. Uh, if you have some other questions for me or for my staff, uh, we have a lot of different ways to get a hold of us. We are, uh, this is our direct line here, this 855-782-4657. Uh, you can also remember this by 855-SUB-INCS. Uh, uh, you can also order online from this 800 number, 800-843-8853. And you can reach us, uh, the entire group, at sublimation at jdsindustries.com. The website, of course, jdsindustries.com. Uh, new for sublimation is our Facebook page. So a lot of resources are going to be uh, populating into that location. And then, of course, our YouTube channel where we can find a lot of the instructions, not only for sublimation but for uh, lasering and Corel Draw and a few other things. So uh, thank you for joining us. This will not be the last webinar we do, um, but thank you for joining me for today, and we'll catch you next time, and I'll Try to get some of your questions answered uh, later today if I can. Thanks for attending.